Sorry. Okay, hello everyone. So welcome to my presentation about the general data protection regu regulation. Mm, here. So the original session name was fun and profit from GDPR, but I, uh, after studying the subject for a bit more, I decided to add the quote. So that's, I doubt that there will be too much fun and I'm pretty sure there won't be a lot of profit from this. So uh, who, who, who knows, uh, who feels that they know a lot about the GDPR? Please raise your hands. Okay. Okay, yeah. And uh, who here thinks that they don't know anything about the subject? So, uh, yeah. And the rest, I assume, are either too lazy to raise their hands or they don't <laughs> really, really know anything about, or they are somewhere in, the, in between. So, yeah, so um, I'm Mikko Hämäläinen, I'm the CEO of Druid. Mm, I've been working on Druid's GDPR compliance since, uh, since uh, late last year. And um, I still, I'm pretty sure that I'm, I'm one of the guys who are like somewhere in between. I'm, I can't really call myself an expert and uh, I doubt there are that many people in Finland or in Europe in general that feel that they are really they know what the legislation really means. Uh, so the about the current situation, I think the privacy, privacy has been, like the state of privacy has stayed pretty much the same for the last 30 years. If you stayed in a, like during the early 80s, you stayed in a hotel in Moscow and you wanted to have something, you just said it aloud. So basically, <laughs> yeah, I'm out of toilet paper and after five minutes, the door, there was a knock on the door and then they provided you with the stuff you actually asked for. <laughs> and nowadays you just say, precede the sentence with OK Google and then you get the stuff. Mm. Of course, uh, regarding the privacy, we're, uh, the current situation is kind of like this wild west. Have you ever received an email or were subscribed to a email list you actually didn't know that you were uh, scrubs, uh, subscribed to. So basically you get this like spam or legitimate marketing mail, but you didn't ask for it. Um, on the other hand, um, you have all this like LinkedIn and Facebook who are suggesting contacts to you that you really didn't know and so on. So there's like a lot of automation behind it. and. Uh, and, and so on. So the GDPR, uh, I think the early draft name was the Google law. So basically, uh, originally it was aimed to put large companies that are collecting shitload of personal data in their place. Because, uh, I mean, I've already surrendered my life to Google. So I have, I use their email, I use their location service. If I want to know what I did on Tuesday, I actually go to the location services and backtrack what I did. I use, I use that to assist my, uh, myself in my time tracking. But this has had uh, some consequences. So seven out of 10 European citizens, they are afraid or worried how corporations use the collected personal data. Mm. On the other hand, nine out of 10 EU citizens are worried of uh, mobile apps collecting a lot of data from them and they don't know how it's being used. So, um, roughly one year from now, there's a chance that this might change. I'm still, I'm pretty sure that the 25th of May next year will be quite a similar day than what the 24th was. I doubt that there will be a lot of change, but uh, of course it's going to happen incrementally. Currently, uh, we have the legislation in place uh, and we are on this like uh, two year transition period. Uh, but honestly, the local authorities, they are really understaffed with the GDPR. The Finnish uh, Data Privacy Authority, they employ 21 people. But on the other hand, there are 280,000 80, companies in Finland. So it means that there are roughly like 13,000 companies that a single like person working in that authority, they need to assist and like manage and check that everything is, uh, is done by the law. So yeah, and 
this is this is regulation, so it means basically that it's uh, they don't need to pass anything on local level. It just up starts applying, and you need to need to like start start uh, complying with that with it. Uh, on the other hand, like besides taming the large corporations, the GDPR aims to assist companies by unifying the legislation. Mm. Although nobody really seems to be caring about the local law now. I mean, of course, there are institutions like banks and insurance companies, or large corporations that follow the current law. But basically, there are like, uh, I'd say like 100,000 marketing registers in Finland that are not complying even with the current law. So, and if you go to, if you, if you, your company has um, like a, does business in several European countries, uh, each of these might have their uh, local laws currently. So this, this aims to unify it. Um, and of course, it's being marketed by fear. So there's high penalties, like 20 million dollars or euros, sorry. And uh, yeah, so this is what the lawyers show you. When you ask them about the GDPR, should I buy your services? They start by, yes, there's a 20 million euro fine. You need to, you need to comply, you need to buy our services. Of course, um, this is the maximum fine. It means that if you, if you screw up like a lot, if you don't really give a damn about the law, then you might end up paying this. But it's like the tr like uh, speeding ticket. So typically you only get like 100 euros and, uh, and something like that. But if you really drive like 300 kilometers uh, on, on a highway, yeah, you definitely will get more. You'll get the maximum penalty. Um, and by the way, uh, you shouldn't, since I'm not a lawyer, you shouldn't trust me on these things. When you consider should you be compliant with the GDPR, the answer is obviously it's yes. It applies to you mm, because it, it applies to uh, all organizations that are either based in EU or they do, do business uh, in EU. Basically, if they're collecting da data uh, of like personal data of EU citizens, then the law applies to you. Whether you're based in China, whether you're based in the US, it applies. Mm. So, so, so yeah, you definitely need to care about this. There are uh, some basic concepts that you need to be aware. Mm. The law itself, it's like 100 pages long. I didn't know that people u still use like three pixel fonts, but yeah, the paper version I have, it's like the tiniest font I've, I've seen in a very long time, and it's 100 pages long. And uh, so it's uh, when you start uh, looking for the like the details and so on for the like how you should comply with the regulation, you need to you need to. It's easier if you find just like something pre-chewed from the net. So uh, there are lots of like uh, material available like this presentation. They're not b made by the officials, but like uh, law firms and other companies. So that that would be a good starting point. Uh, so the definition of, is of personal data is basically it's everything. It's, uh, it's any information that is, uh, relates to an individual. It might be the first name, the last name, the photo of a face, uh, IP address, cookies, something like, like everything basically that you can connect to an, an individual. Then we have a second category. Mm, <coughs> it's sensitive personal data. Um, so if you, th if you thought that uh, like... Um, maintaining or uh, processing personal, uh, personal data is difficult. We have even a second category that's, that makes it even like more difficult or more restricted. So sensitive pers personal data, it basically if it re reveals racial or ethnic origins, uh, religious or philosophical be beliefs, uh, trade union membership, this is, uh, we have one customer who actually we, we, we process this data for them. And of course, like all the, like, sex life and um, so on. Uh, so there are different, different rules apply to these uh, two categories. This is more restricted. Mm. Then we have the roles. So data controllers, the, these are the corporations that uh, own the data. 
So this is the entity that de determines the purposes of, of collecting the data, wh where it can be used, why it's being used, and so on. They basically they own the data. Mm. And uh, so these are typically for us, they are our customers. They are the controllers of the data. And for us as Drupal vendors, we are the hired guns of the digital age. So basically, we are the data processors. For some data, we might be the controllers as well. So for example, my, uh, my staff list. Uh, for that data, I am the controller. But for my client's data, in most cases, I am the processor. Uh, the pro processing basically means um, that whatever you do to that data, whether you're the one who collecting, whether you're the deleting the data, or doing some operations on it, or saving it on the disk, it, that's processing. Mm. And then we have the data subjects. So this is the happy family the law is trying to protect. Uh, so it's a natural person whose personal data is processed by the controller or processor. Um, this, the GDPR, it doesn't apply to individuals. So you're still, as individuals, uh, you're allowed to keep your like, like phone data or emails and and whatnot. It doesn't, it doesn't apply to you. It only applies to uh, public organizations or or uh, corporations. So all this, you have the personal data, sensitive personal data, controllers, processors, and the data subject, and then this is how the chain works. So basically the controller typically collects the data from the, or has some interest in the data of these data subjects, and then the processor, which is this small little Drupal factory there, they process the data for controller. Um, the data subjects, if they're not happy how they are being treated, if they want to ask their rights, if they want to, I don't know, like remove their data uh, and the controller doesn't do that, they can comply to the authorities. So on national level, there's this data protection authority mm, who receives the complaints. Of course, you can sue, as a data subject, you can always sue directly the controllers or the processors. Uh, but you also can, can complain to the data protection authority. In, in this case, it's a local, uh, local authority. This is the organization that employs 21 pe like persons at the moment. So if a lot of people are going to do the complaints, it will shut down pretty quickly or then they need to arrange a huge hiring campaign. So the data protection authorities, there are one instance in each EU country and they collaborate. So the legislation should be the same in whatever if you, um, so there were some questions about in, in one ev event I participated some time ago. So that, okay, does it like if other laws, for example, in, in Italy, for some reason, everybody used Italy as an example where the law doesn't, wouldn't be like so, so strict. But yes, the law is the same in all countries because the authorities, they collaborate. They make sure that it's, it's being like, uh, mm, applied in the same, same way. So, by default, I think, um, like processing the personal data it's, uh, it's highly restricted. But there are some bases where, uh, where you can process it. Uh, so these are, this, this is, these are like the starting points. These are your rights to process personal data. So of, of course we have the consent. So if someone says, tells to you that you are allowed to process the personal data, then you're allowed. The, co the consent, um, it needs to be clear. You can't have these like pre ticked boxes or by using this service, you agree that we spam you every week and so on. No, the consent needs to be explicit and it needs to be clear. Mm. Then we have some, some other basis. So uh, contractual necessity. So for example, uh, if you have a contract of employment, you employ, employ someone. Of course, uh, by this basis, you are allowed to process their personal data. Then we have uh, vital interests. So a uh, he healthcare would be a decent, decent example of this. Uh, compliance with the legal obli obligation. So if you, yeah, so that's basically quite self-explanatory. And then we have uh, 
legitimate interests. So this is interesting because consent is quite difficult. You need to get it from the data subject. Um, you need to, you need to like, they can take the consent away at, at any time they want. Uh, but if you have legitimate interest, it means that uh, you kind of like have that. You, you need to be quite uh, careful with this. But so in sometimes it's better better to use this as a as a basis for processing personal data because then it's like uh, you can use it uh, you can use it without without explicit content. But there's some. But yeah, it's a thin line. I would probably consult a lawyer with this. Okay, so these are, these are the bases, and then we have the uh, principles for processing the personal data. So this is a list of uh, principles, um, and if you process personal data or like control it or, or do basically do anything with it, mm, you need to have a documented, like demonstrate compliance to these. So you need to have a like lawful basis and you need to be able to demonstrate that you are like uh, fulfilling these principles. So the lawfulness, of course, you, you, you need to process the personal data in a lawful manner. Uh, you need to have a le legitimate grounds for collecting the personal data. You, you should be really transparent how, how you use the data, for what purposes you use it and, and so on. Uh, these purposes, when you when you actually define a purpose for for which you uh, are collecting the data, you can switch it. So, so if you have, a, for example, a food delivery service, and they state that they have, let's say, like a legitimate interest for collecting the data because, or no, it's the contractual. They need to like uh, fulfill the contract to deliver the food. They need to ask your name and your home address, but they can't use the same data later. For uh, for ex uh, for example, analyzing where the clients live or for marketing purposes, unless they have stated it in their privacy, like privacy declar declaration. So this is something that you need to give some thought about because uh, in the good old days, which is currently and in the past, it means that you basically you you kind of like uh, be able to do whatever once you have the data, you can use it. No, not legally, I think, but that this has been in, like in practice. But in the future, this is you when you start a project where you are collecting personal data, you need to be like really, really like careful for which purpose you need to think. Then you can't collect the access data. Uh, so if or if you need the home address and the and the name of the like food or or the recipient, uh, you can't ask anything more because it's like you need to only ask for the minimal data set. I have a question. Do we also have to ask like the way the person visiting the site is appeared? I actually asked this from a lawyer and uh, if so if the service is uh, directed First of all, I need to say that the lawyer said that he doesn't really like no, like this is subject to discussion and so on. So, uh, but if the service is uh, directed to children, then definitely you need to verify it. But if you have some uh, like random form on some random adult website, like let's say you have a mail list uh, collecting mail mail addresses for something, you probably wouldn't need to add add like a age check. And if you needed, you would probably need to have like some kind of uh, like official way of identifying it. It might not be enough if you just uh, ask if you're uh, like. Okay. So your random website wouldn't always need a age check when the content mainly is not directed to. Yeah, but I, I can't really say tell, but th this is what I think. Yeah, because I wonder when if it's for instance a new news site and a kid goes there and starts to comment on news, do the, yeah. the kid might need guardian's permission to actually yeah. visit the site. He needs, but you, it's, I, I think we, we, we'll see, let's say, because there are all these working groups that are providing definitions how, how, it, how things should be done in practice. Currently, no one knows. Uh, how does it ap apply to backup services? Mm, well, I really can't tell. It's like a bit more technical. Uh, I mean, the, the whole like technical architecture and so on, how it's like uh, going to be. It's uh, it's going to be interesting. I actually, I, I believe that it probably will mean that whenever you. Well, actually, I don't 
actually, yeah, I don't know. I was <laughs> yeah. Uh, I think the logic is that when you re a backup is sacred, you cannot touch it. But when you restore a backup, uh, you know the date from when it was done, and you have a separate environment when you have all those. Uh, please forget me. Please erase my data. Please do not track me. Informations, and you basically, according to that info, need to uh, sanitize the restored database before actually oh. it is back into production. But regard. Yeah, yeah. So, 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 so the, so the, so the official official uh, response is that yes, everything applies also to backups. Mm. Uh, okay, so the ac accuracy it means that uh, the personal data should be accurate. Accurate. It m in practice it might ne mean that uh, every once in a while when you log into a service they display you. Well, Google I think does this uh, per periodically currently. Yeah. So you please check your information and so on. And then we have the storage limitation, which is also interesting. So it means that you can't keep the data uh, for any longer than it's necessary. Uh, also the legislation there, like for different data, there are different, different periods of time when you, when you can or you must store it. And then integrity and confidentiality. Uh, so yeah. You need to be like uh, do everything in a very secure way when handling personal data, and this you need to demonstrate. When someone comes to your office with a black suit on, and they ask, "Did you comply with the regulations, or have you fucked up?" You need to have the paperwork at hand. You need to hand them that yes, we have started preparing for the GDPR half a year ago. These are the actions. These are the dates what we have done, because it's your responsibility. It's not uh, the government's responsibility to prove you wrong. You need to prove that you're right. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, the, the interesting. <laughs> uh, so n now we have the data subject rights. So they have the right to uh, receive basic information about who processes or handles their data, or if there any, is there any my data being processed, in, processed in your service, and if there is, you need to get uh, you can get a copy in machine readable form, and then you can get information about why this data is being processed and what are your like reasons for doing it and so on. Uh, then, if you're not happy with it, uh, you can object. Not to all all the bases, but for direct marketing, it's absolute. So if you don't want to your data being processed for direct marketing purposes, you can just say no. Stop doing it. Uh, there are some other other um, like bases which you can object to. So, for example, scientific research and so on. Mm. Then you have the right to be uh, forgotten. So, if you want your data to be removed, you can remove your consent. Uh, if the data is no longer needed, you can ask them to remove it and so on. Uh, and then the right to restrict processing. It basically it means like objecting, but you need to. If I uh, want my data processing to be restricted, I can like I can contact the company and tell that please uh, stop uh, like restrict my like the processing of my data. So what they need to do then is that they take the piece of data which is my information and they put it in a sealed box. No one can touch it, touch it. So they can delete the data. It's restricted. It's like untouchable because uh, because deleting is also processing. So so they need to stop processing the data immediately. This might be the case if you want to sue the company, uh, for example. You say that like stop what you're doing. I'm going to get a lawyer and then we're going to check your da the data together. If you have been handing out like disclosing the data to your subcontractors or partners for some reason, obviously you would have uh, to request permission for that. Uh, but you need to inform them them immediately when these these come. So if you, they ask you to remove the data or if they uh, ask you to restrict the processing, then there's the case of uh, profiling and automated dis decision making. Um, so that would mean uh, that. They have the right to object if, for example, if you apply for a loan online and the computer does the decision. And if the computer says no, then you can say that, stop, I don't want this. I want someone like a 
like a living person handle this decision. It's, I'm not okay with it. So if, if we think what the, uh, take a moment and think what the basis, the principle and the, uh, the data subject rights mean from software development perspective, it means a lot. It means that uh, you need to mark certain data as personal data, maybe store, so store them separately. Uh, you need to provide means for the users to identify themselves so that they can pull their own data automatically uh, in JSON format or some, uh, so something like that. Mm. You need to provide means for the users like to delete the data or mark them as restricted or something. And, and uh, of course, when you have the time limit, so after a certain period of time, the data might need to be automatically deleted. So all this is like, it, it actually, uh, like, um, there's a lot of work to be done. Then th we have the data transfers. Uh, so <coughs> transferring data outside European Union, it's not cool. There's a list of like better, co better countries. Basically it's a list of 11 countries, uh, Andorra, Argentina, Canada, f uh, I, like uh, Israel, Isle of Man and so on, which have been the, like the European Union has decided that they have uh, adequate uh, I don't know, like uh, capability of process uh, the, the data in, in a, like a good manners. Uh, or then we have, US isn't on the list, but they have this special program called EU US Privacy Shield program. So basically any US company uh, can go to this website and add their names to the list and saying that yes, we are complying with these rules. No one's going to uh, check it. You can just like declare yourself to be like a good, good, good company from this angle. I don't know how it's going to work out, but yeah, the, but the legislation allows. Then you have the transfer is done using adequate protection method and certain exceptions. For example, uh, consent again. So if I want my data to be processed processed in China, then it's okay. Uh, or fulfilling a contractual obligation, uh, like a hotel reservation. Uh, Someone reserve, uh, I want to reserve a hotel, hotel in China. So basically the, the travel agency needs to send my data to fulfill the obligation. And now for the good part. So preparing for the GDPR. Nice. We are all looking forward to this. But it's not just a task list, it's a, it's a, it's a mindset. Because all, all of these, wh what I just explained to you, it requires you to think. You start the, like the whole application design, you start it from the privacy perspective. What is the data I'm collecting with this service? Then you explain it, uh, like uh, you, you start like the whole architecture, how you are going to handle, what are the reasons. This is like done in the bi during the business development. Why is this data being collected? You need to document everything. So now, I mean, yeah, I would write a note like somewhere in somewhere like, yeah, I, I participated in this seminar because I'm interested. <coughs> I've started my own progress. Document, document and document. It's like Soviet Union all over again. You need everything stamped. You need them in two copies because these documents, they might save your ass someday because someone is going to eventually we're all like in like growing companies and we're like um, during the next 30 years, someone is going to do an audit. I'm pretty sure it's like the taxes. I mean, eventually someone will come and check, check what you have done. So document everything <coughs> during the pro, during the, uh, like the project kickoff, what you have done, what are the decisions? Mo many of these responsibilities are for the controller because they are using the data, but the law applies to processors as well. So whatever you are doing, you need, to, uh, you need to get your instructions from the controller, the data owners in a written form that's actually required by the law. So everything needs to be in writing. Then you might be safe. Uh, for yourself, you need to determine whether you are a controller or a data processor or both. In many cases, both. For example, we are the processor for our client's data. But for our own data, the staff registry, the marketing registry, whatever, we, we, we control the data. 
Then we have the data protection officer. Acronyms, more, three, <laughs> three level. It's not, luckily it's not like a CXO or something, <laughs> but still. So this is, this is a certain person uh, which might, your organization might need to appoint. The officer basically, uh, the situations where you need to appoint this uh, DPO, uh, there's like three specific cases. So whether if you are a public authority or whether your, uh, your core activities consist of uh, processing like large scale processing operations and uh, uh, which require what syst systematic monitoring of data subjects on a large scale. Okay, that's yeah, fa fair enough. If you track people, there's a lot of privacy issues, so you need to, need to appoint this. And then we have the third category, which is that if you process the sensitive user data. Again, trade union membership, yeah, that applies to us. But we don't really know whether we are doing it, is it our core activity to maintain one site, whether it's large scale, if we do it just like uh, from time to time and so on. So when I contacted the, contacted the, mm, the authority, ask them this particular question. We are a consulti consulting company, Drupal agency. We do this. Should I appoint a DPO? She told me, I don't know. Yeah, no one really knows. It's unclear. So wait until the, the autumn and then maybe, maybe we have something like, uh, I'll take the questions later uh, because I think I'm running a bit late. Okay. So how to get started? You need to clear your own, like clean your own nest first. What everyone basically needs to do, you need to create an inventory of all the registries you have in your company. Regardless of if you're an agency or not, you need to figure out what are the uh, registries that you currently own, what, uh, in which cases you are a controller. So you have a recruitment a list of people who want to recruit, which you have processed. You have the uh, staff list. You have marketing registry, customer registry, analytics, and maybe some marketing automation installed somewhere. Then you need to create the list of the processes. So how is this data being handled in your company? What is your current process of handling, like processing personal data? Then you need to check if you have privacy policies. If you have, good, uh, but you probably need to rewrite them. You have contracts of employment, they need, might need some additions regarding the privacy clauses. I, I'm not sure about this. Uh, if you have employees outside the EU, you should be like a bit worried about the data transfers. Uh, you have subcontractors, you may be buying your hosting from Amazon or, or from some random, random hosting company where you really don't know where the data is being, being stored. Okay, so yeah. So you need to, need to create a list of those and you need to renew the contract of your sub, uh, contracts of your subcontractors uh, to comply with the GDPR. Then the qu uh, big question of the data protection officer uh, and then there's high penalty uh, for, um, for data breaches. So if uh, the legislation states that if you're a controller and someone uh, steals or deletes or does some unauthorized processing for your data. Basically, you need to uh, inform the data protection authorities within, I think it was 72 hours. Uh, well, yeah, it's like, what, three days? It should be enough. Mm. But you need to have a process for this. You can't just rely that someone does it. Then you need to have like a process where you actually try to figure out, save as much of the data you can and so on. You need to have this in place. And then we have as agencies, we may need to make sure that we can do business next year legally. So we need to train our staff. Like I said, this is a minds, mindset. So each and single engineer in your company needs to know how they can process personal data. They can't just uh, download SQL dumps from the production server and then save it on a fucking Dropbox or something. So no, it doesn't work like that. So you need to start from the mindset. Everyone needs to know and like needs to, need to be, it needs to be really clear what can be done. Then 
as a company, you probably have some like intellectual property, like uh, preferred architectures and so on. So you need to make sure that those uh, the tools and the and the, like the architectures you prefer using comply with the GDPR. Then there's the PIA or DPIA, which is the Data Protection Impact Assessment. So when you are building a building an, uh, a site which uh, handles personal data, you need to do these assessments to figure out what are the points where things might go wrong and how to, what, what, how to mitigate the risks. And then renewing contracts, this is what your clients are going to ask from you. Do you have a GDPR compliant contract ready for us? Maybe. <laughs> and then, of course, if everything goes to hell, the insurances, maybe they cover something. I, I'm pretty sure that they won't. But the GDPR is still broken. So the longer you wait, uh, wait until you do these things, the more, uh, more material they have ready for you. So there will be, uh, there will be uh, the EU, EU, like the working parties, they're uh, drafting model contracts for certain cases. Things will be a lot clearer in three, three months or half a year than they are at the moment. So for example, the DPO thing is one of these. We definitely need someone, someone to actually figure out whether we need to appoint it or or not. And I think the this this will be resolved. But if you start, if you would start it now, you would need to do everything from from scratch. You would need to like pay tens of thousands of euros to lawyers who are going to do the thing for you. And even they can't be sure at this point. So you should wait. You should start with the first list. So you can start a GDPR compliance task force. Basically, you should treat this, in my opinion, you, sh you should treat this like a project, the, the compliance project. It doesn't happen by itself. You need to run it and you have a deadline and so on. So to me, it sounds like a project. You need to create the inventories. You create the list of uh, internal registries, what you are using, the current processes. Then you need to decide what of that data is still needed. Do you need to keep a list of like your staff t-shirt sizes? When you are ordering t-shirts from to your staff, yeah, it's handy, but do you need to keep that kind of data? Or some other like, sense, like personal data? So you get rid of the what you don't need. Then you make sure that you have the legal basis for keeping, like, keeping on collecting this data. You should schedule a staff training program because yeah, the, the list is quite quite short. The GDPR, you have, I mean, it's it doesn't require a lot. It's still like I, it isn't. I think I caught pretty much everything in, in this slide, so it's not that much. But it's a lot of legwork. Someone needs to figure out how to like this architectural thing. Someone needs to needs to like uh, make sure that you have rewritten your privacy policies and so on. You maybe need to. Uh, check if your marketing registries are uh, legitimate and ask for their, like, uh, ask the permissions again. And wait for more information. So you subscribe to a related mailing list and follow the EU, EU uh, like the privacy websites and so on. So I think it was Floris who said this, like it's like the y y y Y2K all over again. So of course there will be opportunities. Uh, you can do like everything you've done in the past. It might need to be redone. It's a nice, nice like chance. Yes, is your yeah the website you remember we bu built for you like two years ago? Maybe it's not that compliant. We didn't know about the legislation. Maybe we should have a look. But it's it's I don't know. It's like it's complicated. Uh -huh. But for you, uh, I would ask you not to market this to your customers by fear because it's, it's an ugly way to do it. But you should inform that they need to be compliant and you're willing to help and so on. But you can't tell them that you need to buy these services from us or otherwise you need to pay 20 million euros. It sucks. Okay. Um, here we go. This is the final slide. This is the amount of days you have left. <laughs> now, now, now I'm marketing by fear. You need to do something to this shit. Uh, it's 378 days and it will go quickly. 
you lose the summer month and then you're into like what you have 300 days left but the more the longer you wait the more information you have information you have but if you need a legal firm to help you with this the resource might be uh, scarce at the end of the year when everyone's thinking about this thing so it might be at that point it might be a bit difficult to get legal help before the uh, all the law firms are occupied with this so it's a risk you 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 might want to want to like uh, figure anyways so i've collected this information around the net and i'm i'm not a lawyer so anything on these slides you can't really trust uh, i'm not willing to take the responsibility but i tried to I tried my best to keep this information accurate, but uh, yeah, the, the, there's probably at least a couple of mistakes here. Uh, anyways, thank you, and uh, do we have time for questions? I think we have question, uh, one question. One yeah, question. Really I choose you because you are sitting in the front row. <laughs> <laughs> Great. I was just wondering about like the relation between like free form personal free form user submitted data and the kind of the, si the next level personal data. What if a user, basically if we are talking about, for example, a forum or a bi user bio, if a user adds willingly some kind of a personal information that has to do with ethnicity or union membership or what, what when does that actually become next level data? Do you honestly think that I can answer that? <laughs> really? <laughs> I, I just wanted to <laughs> make people think. <laughs> no, no, it, it's, it's a definitely it's a good question. I mean, uh, yeah, maybe there's a need for a forum moderator that says that you can't really tell whether you're like, uh, what is your, what is, what are your sexual preferences? I mean, yeah. But yeah, it's it's really difficult to, I mean. If the user willingly gives the data, so then you might imagine that it's like an explicit consent. Yeah, yeah, that's kind of what I'm But I wouldn't want to like answer to that in a trial, so. <laughs> if I may take over this, please. Um, the thing is, what you said rightfully is actually the principle that they now are going for opt-in rather than opt-out. That's the principle. Before you said, hey, if I don't like opt-out, you can just use my data, but now you have to opt-in. So what you could do like that, you make something, you say opt-in, they, they give you willing for the data, and then you say, okay, then I go low on like the amount of wood I need to put in there because they give it me willingly with their will, and I got the consent. But the problem is with the GDPR, that consent can change later. And if you didn't uh, construct all your stuff in a way that it, you are able to go with that, that the consent changed later by the persons, um, you can't really take yourself the amount of work there because you need to be prepared that they can take your, the consent away later. So you need to deal with that in the first place. Yeah. Super quick question. Do, you, uh, but do we have any low level tools already for Drupal where you prepare for all these requirements? We have started uh, a GDPR module at Drupal.org. I'm not currently aware of what's the status. I think we got it started and then we got knee deep in, uh, like neck deep in customer work. But it's, uh, it's open for contributions. <laughs> so it would be really great to get, have some kind of momentum uh, behind it because it's, uh, I think it, like a lot of things might, might be like, uh, it would be great to automate these yeah. things. The point is that if we wait for six months and we start doing it, uh, then uh, some of the shops here have like tens or maybe hundreds of clients and we don't have enough resources to make them compliant for the deadline. And when the deadline hits, a competitor might just for lulls make a data request and uh, you have maximum of uh, 90 days to comply. And if you don't, your uh, data protection agency comes to you an audit. That's what will happen. Yeah. <laughs> It, it's my, it might be like even a wonder does a lol request at Druid or Druid does a lol request at Exova and in 90 days we're all in shit. <laughs> no, well, actually, it seems you, you, the controller has the obligation to provide the data. So for us, it would be just like more money. <laughs> But it's still, it's a no, not an optimal. There's a, like a, some lawyer calculated that if you, uh, there's kind of, if you, if, an, if a single 
user asks for all the all the like the data and all the obligations like you need to fulfill this and blah 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 the processing of that single request would take one day so imagine what would happen if uh, if you are uh, i don't know like an oil company or something like that and someone uh someone starts up like this campaign against you so let's all ask this like nasty questions from this oil company it would be screwed there's like uh, i think you can get an exception and some more time and you can start charging money for like like multiple requests yeah. yeah yeah but like i said really really difficult <laughs> okay thank you